not so controlled, seduces not just the prince, but the court, the audience, the entire world. Come on. Seduce me. You. Seduce me. What? Spy, I ain't gonna seduce me! Right. Right. Okay. <sighs> okay. Hey there, good looking. I got a bucket of chicken. I'm not one of your fried chicken tramps. I'm a woman. I like my men dangerous, mysterious. You want to be my lover? Earn it. Seduce me! Mark 8, verse 36. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul? That moral is very much prevalent in much of our most popular tragedies, specifically Breaking Bad, Whiplash, and even Perfect Blue. The anime Perfect Blue was a deliberately stressful story which psychologically delved into our main protagonist as she tries to get her way through fame and glory, but through a mixture of peer pressure and other pressures that keep happening to her, she begins to lose her sanity and her grip on the world. This story has in turn influenced other films in here in the West, or more specifically in America, <laughs> with stories like Requiem for a Dream, which I've yet to see, and this one, Black Swan, which I got from the CEX shop, as you can tell. <laughs> this film was requested to me by one of my subscribers during a live stream of Stellar Blade. He suggested watching Black Swan to delve into the Jungian psychological themes that are in this film, and certainly if you're paying attention, the influence from the Perfect Blue anime is very much prevalent here, and it has a very similar story. A woman tries to earn fame and glory, but in doing so, loses her sanity. Now, here, in this film, we see that this character, portrayed by Natalie Portman in an award-winning performance, she is a professional ballerina, training herself to dance for Swan Lake. However, she receives a driven artistic director played by Vincent Cassell, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, who has a very specific artistic vision for his own rendition of Swan Lake. Now, hearing his description of the Swan Lake story heavily thematically ties into the story itself. I suppose it's interesting that this kind of story could arguably have worked with any ballet production. It could be the Nutcracker or uh, something operatic or something like that. But they chose the Swan Lake story. And hearing the description of the story, I could definitely catch on to the thematics early on. That it plays a central role in uh, the uh, psychological downward journey that our main character goes into. The description of Swan Lake is sort of a frog prince story, but unlike the original Grimm's Tale, this one ends rather tragically. It's apparently a story about this woman who's stuck in the body of a white swan, who meets a handsome prince and expects a kiss from him in order to turn back into a human. However, a black swan seduces the prince instead, and the white swan has no other means of freeing herself other than to commit suicide, being free in death. That is the story of the Swan Lake, and this heavily ties into the story of Black Swan, because in this, um, right from the get-go, we have this very fascinating opening sequence with Natalie Portman's character perfectly dancing the sequence of the white swan, only to then get viciously attacked by a dark, ominous figure. This is a foreshadowing to her descent into madness, and her descent into madness starts right from the get-go of the director's specific artistic vision, 
to have the ballet dancer play both the white swan and the black swan. So this is basically the journey of Natalie Portman's character delving into the madness of the black swan, a role in which she, for the life of her, was not really innately built for, and taking on the role in the perfectionistic manner that the director per demands drives her insane. You see, she can dance the white swan pitch perfectly, but the director notices she's not really embracing the black swan. Now, here is where the madness comes in. There are multiple factors that play into how this character delves into madness. First of all, yes, it is the director's perfectionistic manner of pushing her to a role that she wasn't really prepared for, combined with Natalie Portman's character's persistence for fame and excellence in an area where her mother kind of stepped aside. We'll get more into her mother later on. And then, of course, there's the director's persistence of having Natalie Portman embrace her dark side, embrace the Union shadow. Not that they explicitly mention the Union shadow, but thematically that is so. Um, so the director insists that... The director insists that Natalie Portman's character embraces like her dark side and even sexually abuses her. Not that he violates her at night or anything, um, but uh, there is some very suggestive behavior that he does in his office and then during some rehearsing and even in conversation, he verbally abuses her to um, basically abuse herself <laughs> and to the point of self-indulgence to embrace the intoxicating seducing role of the black swan. That's basically what the director is trying to get out of this character. A sense of seduction necessary to really bring the black swan out onto the stage. And the way the director tries to bring that out is very abusive. And there are far, far better ways of bringing about such a character than that. So... Another aspect that delves into the main character's madness is the peer pressure of this rival character. The director says that this rival character is much more naturally in tune with playing the part of the Black Swan than Natalie Portman's character, even though Natalie Portman is meant to be playing both roles. Now, any sane person would just um, shut away their pride and just have this specific actors and actresses play their specific actors and acting roles to portray the kind of message that will bring people to the timeless beauty that they're looking for. But, <laughs> oh boy, pride gets in the way a lot in this kind of story. So the rival character increases the pressure of Natalie Portman's character and to make matters worse, um, back at home, Natalie Portman's character is not so much abused, but pampered. This mother figure of Natalie Portman's character is very much, uh, she, Natalie Portman's character is very pampered. Nina's mother is a former ballerina who never achieved notable career success. She refuses to let Nina grow up, surrounding her with stuffed animals, toys, and music boxes. You can see there's all kinds of uh, innocent fluffy toys. There's the, her room is like fluorescent pink. She's got fluffy pillows. It's a visual indicator associated with very young girls. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with that by itself, but the thing is, um, you can tell that the room is uh, deliberately saturated in its uh, fluorescence in such a way that it's kind of disjointed with the supposedly adult figure that is our main character. I mean, the, there is quite a charm in keeping uh, nice fluffy toys, on, don't get me wrong, but maybe it would have been better if Natalie Portman's character gave the toys to charity so that other generations can aspire for innocence and things like that. A teddy bear, 
a delightful, fluffy little chap that you've had for as long as you can remember. When you were a little kid, you'd contentedly fall asleep holding it, then it would be the first thing you saw when you woke up each morning. It was comforting and fun, and it was always there whenever you needed it. Then, as time passed and you grew older, you began to need the bear less and less, but you could never quite bring yourself to throw it away, because every time you saw it, it brought a fond smile to your face, reminding you of the simple innocence of childhood. And you knew that one day, you'll pass that bear on to your own children, so a whole new generation can make their own happy memories with it. What a charming thought. So... There's a subtle kind of conflict between Natalie Portman's character and her mother in that her mother never really went above and beyond to achieve fame. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in itself because sometimes a modest, humble life is better than a life where you try to achieve fame at the cost of your own soul. But at the same time, the mother is trying to suppress her own daughter in such a way that her daughter won't properly have the chance to succeed because the mother didn't really go above and beyond uh, to uh, conquer her fears or something like that but Natalie Portman wants to um, push beyond what her mother couldn't push herself to I mean there's you could see it the positives and negatives from both sides because th certainly there is a theme of the parents are holding you back from your fool's potential I mean, certainly there's stories that benefit from that, and there's many interesting debates and conversations that can be had from that kind of topic matter. But at the end of the day, and this is something I've learned over the years, the healthiest kind of parenting is the one in which the parents eventually have to let their child go. You have to, if you ever become a parent, you raise your child up necessarily, but when they're old enough, you have to let them go. Natalie Portman's character is at the age where the mother could let her go, but she refuses to let her daughter go. And this leads to a lot of conflict and back and forth. Like, I want my independence, but no, I'm trying to protect you. But at the same time, she's holding her back from her fool's potential. But at the same time, her fool's potential could lead her to danger if taken to a drastic direction. There's a lot of mishmash and conflict. The mother is at fault for not allowing healthy parenting. And Natalie Portman's character is at fault for being rebellious. So it's a hodgepodge of psychological drama there. I find it interesting that... Um, I've n I'm not going to mention them by name, but I know people who, or I, I know people who are very hesitant to have children. But at the same time, when you create some work of art that you intend to make for the public, inevitably you're <laughs> ironically raising that art as if that was your own child. You're making the art as if it was your own child, and eventually you have to let that art go so that it na it's now in the public for them to assess. So um, there's all that sort of thing going on. There's uh, the pressure of trying to keep up. There's uh, um, Natalie Portman's uh, having all these different conflicts spiral around in her, in her head. But ultimately, you could argue that um, someone could go through all that abuse and still make it out on top. But the nature of this film is that of a tragedy. So this is a story where the Natalie Portman's character instead of working hard to take um, a healthy route or maybe even instead of reporting the director's abusive behavior, instead of uh, taking a more healthier career or instead of uh, taking a Cinderella route to um, find grace in all this, Natalie Portman's character herself gives in to the darkness and the madness in many ways. And that is to the detriment of her character. And um, I find the um, aspect of not being able to tell what's real and what's not very fascinating. That, that was definitely more overt in Perfect Blue. But here in Black Swan, it's, um, it's more subtle than in Perfect Blue, but it's definitely still there. So not being able to tell the difference between the real world and the uh, psychological madness plays a prominent role in this film through visions of um, Natalie Portman finding, oh, she's having these gashes. 
The film makes it look as if, oh, these are just happening right out of the blue, but the dialogue from her mother seems to be indicate that she makes a habit of scratching herself. Hmm. So she's very harsh on herself to the point where she doesn't even realize it. And she has all these different kinds of fantasizing, which takes her in unhealthy directions, and her madness gets to the point where she's embracing her dark side more and more, and she can't even tell what reality is, and in order to push herself to what she perceives as fame and glory, she has to kill her innocent self, which leads to, major spoiler alert, during the final performance, after Natalie Portman's character performs the part of the White Swan, behind the scenes, Natalie Portman's character wrestles with her rival character, who she kind of hallucinates as also being herself. And then she manages to stab the other person, um, that person there, with uh, a broken piece of mirror shard, saying, it's my turn now! And she's getting all dark and aggressive. It's interesting how... Um, Creative imagery indicating someone's mind, somebody's mind <laughs> could be used both in a positive and a negative term. One of my favorite films is Amelie, and that delves into the character's sense of imagination in a very vivid, optimistic, and positive sense. And here in Black Swan, we see the opposite. The character is delving more into her dark side. Her eyes kind of go kind of red when she's going, it's my turn now, as she stabs... Arrival. Uh, she's in a gasp of thing. Oh gosh, I stabbed someone. I gotta hide her, hide the blood. And then she embraces the seductive nature of the black swan. And then all the hallucinations he's been having of uh, these black feathers protruding from her arms and her back um, all come here in the scene in which I will admit the special effects are really well done in the sequence where. Natalie Portman as the Black Swan dances her part away, and the audience is taking a gasp as um, she imagines, well, hallucinates, that her arms and her back are getting increasingly more feathery, and then she does the whole pose, and um, I don't know, the way the light goes up on the feather, it's really well done with regards to the uh, uh, visual effects. And then, of course, there's an admittedly really great finale where um, after that sequence, Natalie Portman's character goes back behind the scenes only to realize that her rival's body isn't there. And her rival's saying, oh, hey, um, you were doing great. You are doing great. Um, I'll see you for the finale. Bye. And then she's thinking, what? Then she looks down and she sees the mirror shard on her stomach. She had stabbed herself. So... That crippling self-harm that I mentioned earlier comes into play here. I didn't plan that during this talk, but there you go. There's a deep theme of self-harm and maybe even self-hatred because you wouldn't really harm yourself unless you had some amount of self-hatred for yourself. Some hatred of um, your uh, self that you perceive as holding you back from your fullest potential. And that could be taken in a very toxic direction. And here, it's taken in a very self-deprecating direction to the point where her losing her soul is uh, represented by her quite literally losing her life. She has stabbed herself, but hey, as Freddie Mercury says, the show must go on. And so she performs the finale of um, her dancing the last bit before jumping off a cliff bit and landing on a mattress to give the audience the convincing effect of her falling off. But in the performance, we see that she notices her mother in the audience. She has a borderline sobbing face about what she's gotten herself to and what her mother was trying to prevent her from getting into. And the blood is starting to gush and gush, but then she leaps off and she has a face of peace and contentment. And we have this brilliant scene at the end where the other actors, actresses, and the director say, well done, well done. Oh my gosh, you're wounded. What? The director's just asking, what happened? And then Natalie Portman's character gives out a, gives a, a brilliantly haunting line saying, do you see me? I was perfect. I was perfect. 
And then her vision fades to white. The film ends with the music sequence of Swan Lake. And we see a sequence of feathers and we hear haunting noises of swans in the background. It's really well done. I think that final line really says it all. She achieved perfection, but at the cost of her own life. I've seen a video comparing this film with that of Whiplash, which has a very similar premise, but taken to a masculine degree, where instead of an obsessed artist in the ballet field, here in Whiplash, we have an obsessed artist in the dr jazz drumming area with the uh, <laughs> rather famous the aggressive portrayal of J.K. Simmons as the teacher and the lengths he would go to to train up um, the main character played by the guy from Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> Seriously, if J.K. Simmons was the director in Black Swan, she'd probably be dead. <laughs> Although, I will give praise for this story in regards to, well, it's story. It's, this is a really well-told story. However, it's not without its critiques. My major gripes with this as a film is that it gets a bit too explicit in regards to certain scenes. I know this film is meant to be disturbing on purpose, but there's a reason why I was turned off by films like The Lighthouse. It was a bit too in your face in regards to its disgust factor. And it seems like a missed opportunity for more subtle, modest approaches to these disturbing subject matter. I've seen like films like uh, Sound of Freedom and things like that, where they don't show the explicit stuff, but they do reveal the impact of the disgusting stuff. I'm sure if there was a way to portray it like that. I'm, I would have probably called Black Swan a masterpiece, but otherwise um, I think those scenes were probably held it back from me. I know a lot of people gave, gave this praise, hence why I got an Academy Award, uh, but um, it, it goes a bit far in regards to um, its subject matter. But otherwise, it's a well-told cautionary story, which I would happily give a... Um, Probably a 9.8 out of 12. So thank you to whoever recommended this film for me. It's, I will caution you, it's a very disturbing film, but if you're willing to be strong enough to analyze the disturbances to make room for just perceiving the story as a cautionary story, I think there's definitely something to be gained from this. So what do you think of Black Swan? Let me know in the comments down below, and if you want me to watch Whiplash, I'll probably prioritize that and talk about that, and then talk about J.K. Simmons' performance and stuff like that. <laughs> in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching. God bless you all. Scott Stinker, signing out. You know nothing of man. Far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil.